Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, March 17th, 2014, and here are our top stories. Tonight, the U.S. spy state has turned against itself. Then, the EU's stunning hypocrisy on Crimea. And what part of shall not be infringed does the ATF not understand? That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I don't get scared when I see black ski masks and black helicopters and checkpoints. That's our darling government. I like a proctology exam by the SWAT team commander. Well, there's an amazing turn of events this weekend. As the Crimea declared its independence from Ukraine, the U.S. and the EU demonized them for, for doing the same thing that Ukraine did. And then we see that Ukraine is threatening Crimea for doing what they just did from Russia. Meanwhile, we see that it's going to be no price is too great to pay to get the, what the U.S. and the EU governments want. And pro-Russian Crimeans toast the future with Moscow after a vote. They say flags, chants, music, and plenty of alcohol filled the streets of Crimea's main cities after voters backed joining Russia and breaking away from Ukraine in a disputed referendum. Now, we see that there are independence movements, secession movements going on in Scotland from the UK and Quebec from Canada. There's talk about Venice wanting to secede from Italy. And of course, many people in the states are trying to separate parts of Colorado or New York from the same states. This is something that is a fundamental right of people to decide where their governments are going to be and what level they're going to be. And yet, while they can celebrate it in some areas, they demonize it in others. And it's interesting to note that the Crimea was always an independent, autonomous region under both the Soviet Union and under the Russian Confederation. Paul Joseph Watson points out the EU's stunning hypocrisy in Crimea. He says, following yesterday's referendum, in which people in the Black Sea Peninsula voted 97% in favor of becoming a part of the Russian Federation, the EU responded by slapping sanctions on 21 Russian and Ukrainian officials, declaring the referendum to be illegal. Even when the Irish voters rejected the Lisbon Treaty, he points out in 2008, the EU simply changed the rules that mandated that the treaty could only be passed with a unanimous vote from all member states and passed it anyway, flying in the face of any notion of democracy. That's right, whenever it's to their advantage, they declare how much they love secession and declarations of independence and home rule and self-determination. But if it's not to their advantage, if it's a political move that they think is not something that they want, then they demonize it, and we see that happening here. Now, Ukraine is now going to double down and is threatening war over, with Crimea. They're preparing for war, as Kurt Nemo points out, after the Crimean vote. And this is the quote from the defense minister. He said, Crimea was, is, and will be our territory. Tough talk there. Also, the Russians do not expect Ukraine to honor the deadline of the treaty set for March 21st and leave the Crimea, even though they have said that they would, because of uh, talk like that from the defense minister and what we see from the Ukrainian president. He said, the threat of war is real. We're strengthening our defense capacity. Ukraine is ready to defend its territory. And then the prime minister also said, this is our land. This is Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, or Yats as the State Department calls him. Our fathers and grandfathers have spilled their blood on this island. We won't budge a single centimeter from Ukrainian land. Let Russia and its president know this. So we have the, Ru the Ukrainian president, the Ukrainian prime minister, the defense minister essentially saying they're going to go to war for Crimea leaving the Ukraine, even though the Ukraine left Russia. And the Crimea did it peacefully, unlike the Ukraine. Now listen to what America is doing, and this is what really should concern us, because there's a lot that's going on internally in these countries. It should be a American foreign policy that the founders gave us that we not get entangled in these foreign entanglements, in these foreign intrigues. We don't know everything that's going in the Ukraine, but we do know that this is being pushed by globalist bankers, and we know that it's being pushed by those who work for the military industrial complex, like Senator John McCain who is trying to push everything to get us into war. He says, they only have a few thousand combat troops, talking about the Ukraine, and would be overwhelmed by the Russians if it came to that. One of their urgent requests is to have us, the American government, supply them with weapons, supplying the Ukraines against the Russians, said McCain. I will be urging our administration to arrange that transfer as quickly as possible. That's right, no matter what it takes, we need to go right to the edge of Russia and push them into war. 
Kurt Nemo also points out in another article, the U.S. and the EU say that making Europeans suffer is a, quote, price worth paying in order to punish Russia over the Ukraine. Obama called Vladimir Putin over the weekend and told him that the Crimea will never be recognized by the United States or the international community. And we also hear from the Washington Post that the West could also suffer costs if Russia cuts off energy supplies to Europe and further squeezes the Ukrainian economy. But Western officials say that is a price they're willing to pay and have pledged support to the Ukraine. Sounds very much like what Madeleine Albright said during the Clinton administration when she was asked if the Iraq sanctions were worth the price of a half a million children in Iraq dying because they couldn't get food, medical supplies, other things. And she said, it was worth it. It was a price worth paying. You see, they don't think that your life or the lives of anyone, any human being, whether they're an American or whether they're a Ukrainian or Crimean or an Iraqi, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is their political agenda. And no matter what price you pay, it's worth it to them. Because they're going to play Russian roulette, as Kurt Nemo points out in his article, as Alex Jones has said. They've got Russian roulette going with a loaded pistol. And the only question is, every, every one of the chambers has got a round in it. The only question is, what are they going to shoot? Are they going to shoot themselves or us in the foot or in the head? That's the only question. Is it going to be a trade war, a cold war, a nuclear war? They don't really care as long as they get their political wishes accomplished. Are the Russians afraid of trade sanctions? Well, it appears not. Now, this is an economic advisor to Vladimir Putin. His name is Sergei Glazyev, and he said that Russia can dodge any proposed U.S. sanctions by switching to other currencies and creating its own payment system. He went on to claim that Moscow would recommend that everyone get rid of their U.S. Treasury bonds if the U.S froze the assets of Russian public institutions and private investors, and he added that Russia would also have to default on its loans to American banks. It doesn't sound like they're very intimidated. It also was denied, however, by a criminal official who denounced his remarks and said that he did not speak for the Russian government. So clearly what they're doing here is they're throwing out a trial balloon, firing this, this comment out to see how the reaction is, telling people that they're not going to be pushed around. Clearly, that is a possibility. It is a clear possibility that they might destroy the advantage that the United States has had by being the world's cur reserve currency with petrodollars. Now, in more stunning hypocrisy, we see Dianne Feinstein saying yesterday on the news that she wants private drones to be taken out. You know, she has a problem with bloggers exercising their free speech she has a problem with people owning guns if they don't work for the government. And of course, she was very intimidated by seeing a drone at her house, even though the drone didn't have any camera and didn't have any missiles. Jakari Jackson has more on that. When is a drone picture a benefit to society? When does it become stalking? When does it invade privacy? How close to a home can a drone go? I'm in my home and there's a demonstration out front and I go to peek out the window and there's a drone facing me. <laughs> well, whoever was running it turned it around quickly and it crashed. Senator Dianne Feinstein is very concerned about her personal privacy, but thinks it's just peachy keen for other American citizens to be spied on. The senator claims that the CIA violated the Fourth Amendment rights of herself and her colleagues, a claim that the CIA denies. No surprise there. The matter is being dealt with in the appropriate way, being looked at by the uh, th right authorities, and the facts will come out. But let me assure you that CIA in no way was spying on the SSCI or the Senate. We greatly respect the separation of powers between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And uh, we're going to do everything possible to work with the committee in the future on its report. With a former CIA director being spied on, it wouldn't surprise me at all that anyone in the U.S., or any place in the world for that matter, could fall victim to the prying eyes of Big Brother. And the CIA isn't the only alphabet agency in on the fun. New Snowden documents show that the NSA is pretending to be Facebook in order to infect computers with tracking malware. This, of course, is to say nothing of the government spying via webcams, laptops, Xboxes, and cell phones. So let this be a reminder to the powers that be. Suppression of rights may start at the bottom, but it always creeps towards the top. 
You can find more reports at Infowars.com. That's right. Don't shoot any video of Dianne Feinstein with a drone, but she doesn't have a problem if Obama shoots innocent people in wedding parties using a drone. And of course, I guess we could say, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn all of your drones in, just like your guns. See, the Senate is allowed to have privacy, but you're not allowed to have privacy. The Senate and the politicians could have complete control of media, but you need to get a license if you're going to be a blogger. You need to be licensed as legitimate, as a legitimate uh, press individual. And of course, they have cameras everywhere, but don't even think about putting one on a drone. Now, she also had this to say. She said, this is a whole new world. Yeah, it sure is. And it has many complications. What is an appropriate law enforcement use for a drone? When do you have to have a warrant and when do you not have to have a warrant? What's the appropriate governmental use for a drone? See, in her world, in her brave new world, you and I don't have any tools of technology, of surveillance, of protection. We can't protect ourselves with video or with guns. Only the government has it. So in her view, only all I need to do is see what the government can do because for you and I, it's simply going to be banned. Now we can see this also with other alphabet agencies. Look at what the ATF did over the weekend. Last week we reported that they were being held back by a restraining order from a judge. Well, it turns out you can't restrain the ATF. Yeah, they're just like Judge Dredd. As Kit Daniels reports, ATF agents equipped with M4s and plate armor conducted a raid on Ares Armor in National City, California. And as he's pointing out, this is really a way to intimidate their customers. They had arbitrarily declared a particular product that was being made by this company to be illegal. And so they were going to confiscate not only those, but the names of the people who had purchased those things. And that firearms company, to their credit, fought very hard to try to keep the names of the people who had purchased those things private. But of course, the ATF ignored the order. They got another judge to overrule that order, a higher court to overrule that, and went in and seized it as an armed raid. They were very much afraid for their safety, as they should be, because we've seen over and over again how these things go. Now, the issue here is that you've got yet another case where an alphabet agency, whether it's the ATF or the IRS or the DEA or the EPA or the FDA, all of these alphabet tyranny agencies have begun acting like Judge Dredd. They write the law, they judge whether or not you are in violation of their law, they enforce the law, you have no presumption of innocence, and you don't get to go to a court. They're judge, jury, executioner, and legislator, and that's what's going on with all of these organizations. We just saw the same thing happen with the EPA last week with a farmer in Montana who put a pond on his farm. They write new regulations, and then they come after you in their own courts with their own enforcers. Now, we also see that the TSA turned out in force today at St. Patrick's Day. Today, of course, is St. Patrick's Day. As Adon Salazar points out, the mammoth federal agency continues its unchallenged invasion of non-transportation related events. Maybe the purpose of the TSA at the St. Patrick's Day events was to remind us of another infamous group that fought secession and home rule, and that would be the Black and Tans. Now, we also learned today that the internet, the last part of the internet, is going to be turned over to some global body. Who? We don't exactly know yet. The Commerce Department announced that they're going to start the process of transitioning oversight of the internet's domain name system, that's DNS, to a non-governmental entity. They said they look forward to ICON convening stakeholders across the global internet community to craft an appropriate transition plan. Well, the question is, who are the stakeholders? Who is the global internet community that this is going to be turned over to? And we've had some pushback from some Republicans, which is a good thing. They've said, uh, Senator Tim Scott, Republican of South Carolina, said the, quote, global internet community that this would empower has no First Amendment. But the question is, who are they? And when we see people talking about stakeholders and global organizations that are not governmental, which is what they're saying, they're not going to turn it over to a government organization or a group of governments. So who are they going to turn this over to? Is this going to be to the Trans-Pacific Partnership? 